Kia ora koutou, uh, ko Andrew Aho. My name's Andrew. I'm really sorry that I can't be with you this weekend. Um, I was looking forward to it and I hope you're having a really good time. Um, Dave asked me to still um, share some thoughts um, and I thought I would just talk for hopefully less than 15 minutes. I'm going to set myself a timer. Um, throw a bunch of ideas out there at you. Um, maybe some of them will be provocative um, and you can respond to them in your own time. I wish that I got to have this conversation with you and talk through what you make of it um, because I'm uh, going to broadly generalize about how young people think about Christianity, but also how they think about their lives and why I think a lot of uh, church spaces, both on the center and the edge, continue to misunderstand um, this way of interpreting uh, the world. Um, but I could be super wrong. So I'm keen to hear what others think. And uh, please, um, I'm, I, I'm based in Tamaki. I love, I love coffee. Um, if you want to chat further, um, I'd love to do that. And I'll send some links of things I've written on this topic if that's of interest to you. Anyway, enough throat clearing. Um, let's go. Young people and Christianity, or under 25s in Christianity. Quick disclaimer, all the categories and generational sort of um, definitions I give in this uh, little corridor are pretty loose, um, so don't hold them too lightly. But I think that what I'm going to try to say is true enough to be true. Um, and importantly, whether or not it reflects actual realities, I think it reflects felt realities. This is how I think a lot of young people feel about their lives, and those feelings determine how they're going to act, um, whether or not it's true, um, or whether or not it's actually the reality. Um, perception shape how we act, and that's just uh, one of those things in life. If I were to try broadly scope out what I think has happened um, in the last generation, um, this is a generation less than, younger than me. I'm, I'm 25, so I sit right on the cusp of millennials and Gen Zs. Um, anyone younger than me would easily be Gen Z. Anyone older is usually um, millennial. Um, is that the social contract broadly has failed. If you are a boomer, let's say 55 and up, 60 and up maybe, you broadly grew up in a context in the West in which there was a coherent social contract, a shared enough understanding of what you could do as a member of society to um, benefit from what society uh, has to offer. Um, this is what we call this the good life, okay? That's what I'm going to call it. The good life was a shared enough understanding. It involves something like this. It's very familiar to many of us. Uh, work hard at school, possibly university, get a good job. Uh, with that job, work hard at it, stay loyal to it, and they'll remain loyal to you. And you'll be rewarded with a stable career that will last you your life and also give you a decent enough income to care for your family. That family, which is a kind of second thing, so we have work, then we have family, your work would provide enough to care for your family, which was almost exclusively and entirely a man and a woman who lived together, had a couple kids in a nuclear family type of setting and lived in suburbia. And that family unit was good. It was the best way to have children. It was the best way to structure society. Even if there were obviously huge demons, this is still a broad, shared, agreed upon understanding of what life was to look like. And through your loyalty to your company and your company's loyalty to you, through your loyalty to your family and your family's loyalty to you, you could buy property. It was a huge part of the dream is the white picket fence, right? Uh, you would be accessible to the property market. Uh, you would um, be able to build wealth through that and you'd be guaranteed a good future. Your kids would be set up well. You'd have a stable place to raise them, but also your retirement would be taken care of. So you didn't really have to worry financially that much. Now, of course, this is a super white, super middle class way of thinking about the world, but it's a narrative, I'm sure, that comes to no surprise to us. Now, for young people, of course, this social contract, the good life, it failed, okay? Millennials were the first big generation to experience this failure, okay? Gen X sits somewhere in the middle, as they always do. I'm not really sure what they're up to. But millennials, post-global financial crisis, um, it's like just one big example. Um, the good life failed, right? Stable careers and workplaces were broadly disrupted by neoliberalism. The company loyalty is no longer a thing that exists anymore, um, and this is mark and if it's profitable. Um, and also by the internet. The internet disrupted careers. It disrupted stable um, realities because you could make money in different ways. You could have a, a, a more fluid gig economy, um, which sounds attractive, but actually like makes is harder for workers. Um, so work workplaces were completely 
completely overturned and, and, and restructured. The ideas of family changed for millennials, for people older than me. Um, the uh, increasing acceptance of queerness. Um, I won't say outright acceptance, but you know, you have gay marriages legalized in most Western countries in the last 20 years. That's something that a generation ago is just kind of unfathomable. Um, the idea that, um, yeah, different uh, alternative or non-hetero expressions of gender sexuality were even acceptable. They became more acceptable. So they, the family ideas shifted and divorce rates. Divorce in the 90s became much more normalized than it used to be. A lot of stigma about divorce was lifted. And so the, the nuclear family idea just didn't hold as much sway. Okay, then it comes to home ownership. Of course, we know this one. 2008 is another great marker in the sand. Home ownership gets dismantled. And property markets, uh, you know, dramatically expand and, and balloon. People keep saying they're going to burst, but they never do. And so what you have is this sense of betrayal. Millennials feel betrayed. They were promised the good life. Boomers had it, right? Boomers had the good life and they have used it. But they promised it to their kids, millennials. But millennials had the rug swept under their feet and they felt a sense of betrayal there. And so they often rebel. This is why so much generational theory tends to talk about boomers and millennials, the constant kind of tension and conflict with each other. They blame each other for the world's problems. But the reality is for millennials, the promised good life, the buy-in that you could have failed and they felt angry about that. But here's the key difference that I think a lot of people that I talk to in the church, church spaces, both center and edge, are failing to recognize. For Gen Z, for people younger than me, there is no more social contract. Okay? If Gen Z know about the good life, it is only mediated to them through memory or through like media, like let's say Friends, okay? Friends is a TV show. Now, whether or not Friends was an accurate picture of reality doesn't actually matter, but it represented something culturally about life at that time, right? That vision of the good life is completely, uh, is, is, doesn't exist for young people anymore. They never grew up in a world in which the good life was a reality. They grew up in a world in which the internet was always present. Neoliberalism was complete the status quo. There's no memory of something prior, right? They grew up in a world in which it wasn't just increasingly acceptable that queerness was um, part of life. It just was a fact. People have different gender expressions. People have different orientations. That's just a fact of life. There's not so much the need to debate whether it's okay or not. There's just an acceptance that it is, of course, obviously, self-evidently. Um, marriage has a low cultural capital for most people. Most people my age, even a little bit older and younger, just don't see themselves getting married, especially if they're not Christian, even Christians, but especially if they're not Christian, they just don't see it as something that they need to do. And home ownership for their whole lives has been out of reach. Their own parents, their Gen X parents probably struggled with, um, homes. They probably struggled with rent. They've never known, a, they've never known a world. So, so for, for millennials rejected this vision of the social contract, this vision of the good life, Gen Z don't have have never had it. And so it, um, this, this completely changes, I think, the way that young people are imagining their future and in, are imagining um, what they should do with their lives, the types of decisions they should make. Because of course, as many of us know, Christianity by and large in the West in the last few generations has more or less been tied to the good life, right? If you wanted to benefit in the um, privileges and prosperities that the good life would give you. Part of that was committing to a local organization in general, but especially committing to the church. People 40, 50 years ago, if you want to be a good, good people, go to church. And if you're a bad person, you might skip church on Sunday. There's still a, a social coercion and compulsion there because social constructs and social contracts create what, um, I don't know if someone else has said this, but I'm just going to say the rule of the ought, right? I ought to do things. If I have this vision, this shared cohesive understanding of what I can get out of society, then I ought to do things to get those benefits from society. Churches basically on a, on a structural level, on a financial level especially, have built themselves around assumptions of the ought. Particularly, I ought to attend regularly and I ought to give money to it. And maybe I ought to support leaders in it too. But I think those two are particular, like really, Regular attendance and money is really what most churches structure their common life on together, right? For millennials, I still think there's a lingering ought because remember, they still grew up in a world in which the good life was promised to them. And actually for millennials, I think a lot of them still got the good life. It just took longer, right? If you were a boomer, you could have a house and a stable career and a wife and kids, let's say, 
by 25. Okay, I, that's that's gendered because that's 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 the, the vision of life is gendered, right? It's masculine. But if you're a millennial, maybe you got a home ownership in your late 30s. Okay, you still got there. It just took kind of longer. But for Gen Z, whether whether or not they will own homes, whether or not they will actually have kids, they don't think of themselves as having those things. They don't think of the only real ought that I think young people have is authenticity to the self. Okay. This feels like we, this is a very, a lot of young, older people are critical of this. They think that this, this is proof that young people don't care about others, but the only ought that you can really rely on is an authenticity of the self. You should do what works for you and don't really impinge on others ability to do what works for them. But churches by and large rely on the shared vision and social contract of the good life to create enough oughts that people participate in their structures. And those oughts, I, not, I think, are completely gone. So if you want to go to church, that's, I, I, don't, I think young people are surprisingly open to that idea about religion. Religion is exotic and interesting because they have no real connection to it. You might want to do that, but also you might not want to do that. There's no coercion or compulsion or ought. It's just whether or not that works for you as an individual. When we think about this vision of the good life and we think about the um, rule of the ought as well, this poses a massive problem for us on the edge. We, we, we might be tempted to write all this, um, this, this, this story I'm telling as um, something which the center church is going to suffer with and the center church is going to suffer with it. But the edge is going to suffer with it too because the edge still broadly relies on the rejection of the good life as being the package that you can buy into, right? Think about Shea Claiborne, Irresistible Revolution, that's, that's the narrative is you've been sold Christianity with a picket white, a white picket fence and a nuclear family, but there's an alternative way of Jesus. That's edgy, exciting, countercultural, come and join. It's much better. That's kind of like, it, it, that's a, it's a caricature, but that's broadly what it says, right? That still relies on some shared sense of reality that can be rejected and entered into. So a counterculture still relies on a normative culture, right? There is no normative culture anymore. The world is multipolar for young people because you can't rely on any of those things to provide you any prosperity anymore. They never grew up in a world in which those options for prosperity existed. So all you really can do is remain authentic to yourself. If you want to participate in a countercultural way of life, that's cool. Oh, I'm really interested in that. But but there's not going to be a strong sense of compulsion or ought to participate in those things. The thing about this is that people often mistake this quest for authenticity as an apathy. And I mean, sometimes it is, right? But in broad, broad terms, I think it's more a self-defense mechanism. I think young people still care a lot. I still care a lot, right? You can go to any protest movement in the last five years and tens of thousands of young people are turning out for ecological justice, fertility issues, for issues of, of race and gender, right? But young people, the difference is young people don't go from those protests and then join a political party, right? They're not gonna pay a membership fee. They're not going to go to a weekly meeting because by and large, institutions themselves have failed. We don't live in a context anymore in which those things can be relied on. The world is multipolar, right? There's no sense of which institutions can provide meaning or authority or prosperity for anything anymore. And so this is self-protection mechanism to not give yourself to those things. I, Dave and I, in, uh, just talking about this, we're talking about the Green Party, right? The Green Party in our current parliamentary system represents definitely um, the most activist party we probably have. Uh, it represents things that typically young people have cared about in terms of social justice. But the Green Party is in shambles, right? It's, it's caucus discipline is terrible. It has all this infighting. It promises to be something that it seems like it's not. Um, I, I don't know about the complexities of running a political party, right? Um, but there is still this pretty wide sense of, uh, of abandonment from institutions. And it's the exact same thing when it comes to the church. For young people who have been around churches or have given themselves to churches, I think it's only a matter of time until you recognize that churches aren't really uh, living up to what they say they do. And it doesn't matter whether they have in the past or, or, or whatever, right? What matters is that the promises of the past have, are now completely dead. There's, there's, no one invests in them anymore. And so you're not going to invest your time. There's no ought. 
if, if you don't believe in the fact that an institution can provide prosperity or provide you um, some way to live, then you have no ought or compulsion to it. And that changes the way you relate to it. This is a huge problem for centre churches. I think most centre churches still assume young people are coming back, right? And I think millennials, millennials are coming back. People older than me, people five, ten years older than me, they are having children. They are buying property. I, I grew up on the shore, so that speaks to the class that I'm in. But they, they, it's, they have had careers. And when those things fall into place, this old vision of the good life for millennials, they, they go back to church. Churches are great for families, right? Or for some young families. Again, I'm, I'm speaking in very broad generalizations. But for young people, I'm not convinced that they will return. They may, peep, teenagers might grow up and have children. They may have heteronormative relationships. They may have stable careers. They may even buy property. But whether or not they even participate in those things, the felt difference that those things have failed them and that is, is tremendous. It means that they won't have any sense of ought to give back to these things. All right, I have done a lot of talking, a lot of very fast talking and a lot of talking at you. Um, I hope that this has been helpful. I hope that there is some uh, rich fodder for conversation that can be pulled out of um, what I just shared. Um, and like I said, I'm really keen to talk to people more about this. Um, I'll try to send out a little one page, a summary of what I tried to say. Um, uh, I really also um, just want to bless you and all that you guys do. Um, I hope I haven't come across too critical. I, I believe in the edge. I, I, I believe in these things. Um, but as a young person myself, I, I, I feel the tensions of, of how much to, to truly buy into them, uh, what it means to participate in things that when they feel fragmented, um, who do I even look to uh, to guide me through this chaos when there is no shared sense of uh, reality anymore? And the only, the, the, the broad um, narrative I feel in my life is that things are chaotic and just getting worse. Um, so those, those, those are some of the things we grapple with, but I, 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 I do truly believe in what you're doing and I understand that it's a difficult thing to do. Um, and uh, I just hope that this weekend as well is a fantastic way for you to be refreshed and hopefully encouraged and, and maybe challenged as well. Um, I'll send my contact details to Dave, but um, nice to virtually kind of see you all and good luck with the rest of the day. Kakeets. <laughs>